Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, all right. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. You all ready to have a, have, have a great uh, Thanksgiving week? Kids are off school this week. That always makes for a challenge leading up to it, but uh, looking forward to that. My daughter's super excited. She got a hamster this week, so big, big excitement around the house, right, at least? Yeah, she's got a hamster, so that's, yeah. She's grateful. So we're going to continue Savage Jesus, but I want to just remind you of something I announced last week. Um, we have decided as a staff that in order to, to make room for all of the people that God is bringing our way, we are going to need to go to a third service. Now, we do this, yeah, we do it with much fear and trembling because three services means we need a whole new set of volunteers who are going to step up and help serve the people that God is bringing to us. So what we're looking for is we want you to consider and and, and prayerfully consider over the next few weeks, the the three services will start on Christmas Eve, okay? So on Christmas Eve is we're going to launch our first three services. They'll be at 8.30, 10, and Wait, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Yes. Yeah. And we'll stick with an hour, hour service. Uh, Pastor Mark said might go an hour 10, but, uh, you know, <laughs> we'll keep generally an hour service. And, uh, but we need new volunteers. So I heard a stat this week that I think is fascinating. It says one of the number one predictors of a, of a, a child staying, a, a, a teenager staying in church after they leave the home is if they get involved in serving at church before they're age 16. Yeah. So what I want to encourage you to do, I want to throw out this challenge. What if you guys considered committing to one year of serving as a family here on a Sunday morning? You say, we're going to find a place. We're all going to get involved. Some of us in kids, some in greeting. There's some, maybe some of your kids would be great at tech back there. You'd like to teach them. We've got some of that cutting edge technology back there that they could learn. But we need people to step up because we can't do this without you. We are the church. That's all of you. Like, great. We need you to step up in that area. So I want to ask you to consider praying about where you could get involved. We've got needs in kids and greeting and tech. And we're going to ask you to do this. Attend one service and then serve in one service or serve and then attend. But that'll be starting on Christmas Eve. You can sign up. If you go to the app, there's a thing that says next steps. And if you hit next steps, there's a button that says volunteer. You just sign that in, put in your name, stay where you'd like to to volunteer. If you don't know where you want to volunteer, just give us a call. We'll talk you through and figure out where you would be maybe best best fit for you. And listen, you may try something and go, this isn't a good fit for me. Don't give up if the first thing you try isn't a good fit, right? I tried many things serving in the church, mostly because I was forced to, I was voluntold. I'm a pastor as kid. Uh, so my dad would say, you're going to do this this week. And I found areas where it worked. But this is one of the great ways for your family to get involved together is serving as a family during one service and then attending one. Cool? Yes. All right. We're continuing our series this morning called Savage Jesus, where we're talking about some of the more harsh things that Jesus said that when you look at them, we go, man, Jesus, that was kind of cold-blooded. There's the like, we love sweet Jesus, Hallmark Jesus, Hallmark Jesus on the cards, come to me and I'll give you rest. Right? Yeah. But then we see there's all sorts of other things Jesus said to you go, that is just savage, Jesus. I can't believe Jesus said that. That wasn't very Jesus-like. But Jesus was a very, Jesus was fullness of truth. And sometimes truth comes in a form that kind of slaps you across the face and you got to deal with what he said. But there's hope in everything he said. And we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about one of the most, honestly, this is probably the most bizarre thing Jesus said. In fact, if you research what he said, nobody's actually sure what he said. For 2,000 years, theologians have been trying to figure out what in God's name, literally, was Jesus talking about when he said this. Because here, here's, here's what he said. Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Have you ever done something that when some, or have, has somebody ever done something to you that afterwards you said, that was just completely unforgivable? unforgivable. Anybody ever have that happen? Yeah. Well, look, you got to forgive. But, <laughs> but there's something, there's one thing that Jesus said, if you do this one thing, it's unforgivable. He says, I won't forgive you in this life or the next. One sin that if you do this, it is absolutely unforgivable. And some of you are going, oh no, did I do that sin? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But first, let me rewind. And we're going to start with this. So my dad and mom came to me two weeks ago, and they, had, they said, hey, this is kind of an awkward question, but we want to know something. Are you okay if we're buried in a pine box? 
I was like, what? It's like, it's fine with me. Are you okay being buried in a pine box? <laughs> and my dad's like, I don't care. I'm not going to know. I was like, okay. I said, why are you asking? He said, well, we just want to make sure that all of the family is okay with this because we're wanting to set up, pre-set up our funeral stuff. And I'm like, these are awkward conversations. I don't want to be talking about your funeral. Dad's like, well, I just turned 69. At some point, I'm going to die. And we want to make sure this is figured out and set, apart, set aside. And we want to make sure that our wishes are known ahead so that there's no issues afterwards. And it reminded me of one of the first times I got asked to help a family plan a funeral. And it was, I didn't know what I was doing. I was in my 20s. And this family, we got together and I showed up at the funeral home and, and, and I showed up and I could tell something really tense was going on. And they were arguing literally over what kind of a casket to bury their mother in. And one, one was saying, well, she would want to be, we, don't you love mom? We would want to put her in the nicest one. Like, yeah, but the nicest one's like, you know, $14,000 to bury her in it. And the other one's like, she wouldn't care what she's buried in. And everybody's arguing about what would mom want. And it was really awkward. And they, then they looked at me and I'm like, I didn't even know mom. I don't know what mama would want. And then one of the ladies, she got so mad. She goes, you're all the devil. And she stormed out to go smoke a cigarette. <laughs> and it got me thinking because there's a moment that we're going to talk about today where somebody actually accused Jesus of being the devil. And it's in this weird passage where Jesus talks about the unforgivable sin. And it's this whole weird, bizarre thing that all revolves around this question. Like, who's right because Jesus left the earth and he said all this stuff, but have you noticed nobody has quite, we, we can't all quite get on the same page about what Jesus would have actually wanted from us in a lot of areas. Wow. There were some things he was really clear about, but some things it's kind of complex and you go, well, what would, in this case, dad have wanted? What would Jesus have wanted? But he's not around to tell us and he left us the word. But if you've noticed some, there's some things that just aren't really spelled out in the Bible. And you go, well, I don't know what to do. Well, there's principles. And we've all got some areas of our life where when we look at them, we go, I want to do what's right. But the question is, who is right? You've got some people you're going to meet with this week. They're family members. And every time y'all get together, that thing comes up. And, they, and, and you know, your brother, maybe it's not you, but it's your brother and your sister. They start yelling at each other. And they're looking to you and they're like, well, which one of us right? And you're like, oh. I don't know. Like, I can see both sides of the story here. Like, I see why you're upset. There's so many things in life that just aren't black and white. And we go, well, who's right? You look politically. Look at some people. And, and, and it's gotten to the point in politics where we look at some people and, they, and we say, we re they really are the devil. <laughs> you're the devil. But, but yet sometimes the things that they're saying have some validity to them. And we're, we're, it's to our, at our peril that we write off people from the other side that we think are the devil because maybe they're speaking the truth about some things. Sometimes you got to give the devil his due, as they say. And we've all got these situations in our life where we go, well, who's right? Anybody dealing with that right now? Maybe you got a situation at work. you got conflict at work and you're going, Who's right? And maybe you, you're convinced, you're absolutely convinced you're right. And you're thinking, how in the world could they possibly think that? So how do you deal with this question of who is right? And there's this story, Jesus from his life. It's one of the most bizarre stories in there. Stuff he said, I'm not even going to pretend that I know what he said because people that are like 10 times smarter than me have never been able to figure out what he was exactly saying. But we're going to delve into maybe what, what he was saying on a big picture. So here's, here's the scenario. A demon, the demon-pressed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus. And Jesus healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And the people were amazed. And they said, can this be the son of David? Like, is this the Messiah we've been waiting for? But when the Pharisees, these were the teachers of the law, these were the pastors of the day, heard it, they said, it's only by Satan, Beelzebul, or Beelzebub, you may have heard. Like, he's Satan. That the, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. So some people are going, wow, this is the guy. And others are going, no, oh, that's Satan incarnate right there. Can you imagine that? Like, what could make you think that Jesus was Satan? 
So knowing their thoughts, this is the problem with Jesus. You don't hang around with him much because he knows your thoughts. (laughs) He said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. Abraham Lincoln said that in one of his famous speeches, right? And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So he's like, guys, let's just do some logical calculations here. Why would Satan attack his own? How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Satan or Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Now, I think this is just snark right here. He's just like, that's just brutal. He's like, it's kind of a yo mama, right? Like, Therefore, they will be your judges. Again, this is a weird, isn't this weird? Like, what's he talking about? Uh, Anyway. But if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. And this is where Jesus goes. He says, whoever is not with me is against me. You're either with me or with the terrorists. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy, blasphemy is speaking something profane against God, will be forgiven people. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Other versions say neither in this life nor the next. I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years, and I've heard all sorts of explanations for this. <laughs> Nobody really knows what, exactly what he's saying. But I, I want to look at kind of the big picture here. So if you pull back and you say, what's, what's the essence of what he's saying? I think what he's saying is this. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're all equal. They're co-equal. The Holy Spirit is really, 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 really important. And you disregard him at your peril. In fact, if you disregard him, you're in big, big trouble in your spiritual walk. Because if you look at the sequence of how God revealed himself to man, he brought Jesus and Jesus brought our salvation. Through him, we have salvation. He paid the price for our sins that we could never pay for ourselves. But then right before he was leaving earth, he said, guys, I wish I could stick around with you, but I'm going to send somebody that's even better. You go, who could be better than Jesus? Jesus said this himself. Check this out. This is what he says. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I'm leaving. You're going to be glad I'm gone. Sometimes I don't know if I agree with that because I can't tell you how many times I've been like, Jesus, just show up and tell me what I'm supposed to do. Anybody ever felt that? The longer I walk with God, the more I'm like, just show up and tell me what I'm supposed to do. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I'm going to send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. He's saying, guys, I know you wish I could stick around forever, but I'm sending somebody that's even better. And he's part of me. The Holy Spirit is just as much a part of God as Jesus is. And he's going to sit, and, and the first gift that the Holy Spirit brings is the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin. And you go, well, okay, that's great. But this is what's tricky about it. When Jesus came, he upped the ante on what's required of us. You know, there was the Ten Commandments, and everybody's like, well, if we follow the Ten Commandments, we're good. And Jesus said, no, no, I got, I got even higher standards for you than that. Is that. You know, the Bible says, he says, the, the commandments say don't commit adultery. I'm telling you this, if you even look at a woman with lust in your eyes, it's done. You've committed the sin. Right. You go, wow. Yeah. Who can even live up to that? Right. Like we talked about what Jesus asked last week is really, really hard. Jesus upped the ante, and this is what's tricky. There will be times in your life that there may be something for you that would be a sin that may not be a sin for another person. You go, wait, what? What does that mean? I'll give you an example of this. When I was younger, um, I was in my teens. I had all my friends and they were dating girls. And uh, I said, I I, I felt like just in my heart that I wasn't supposed to, to date. I felt like God was saying, I don't want you to date any girls. 
And you know what I did? I went and I dated this girl and I kissed her and I felt so guilty about it. And I told my dad, I was like, dad, why do I feel so guilty about this? And he goes, well, it's quite possible that others can, you may not. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, look, this is the challenge of what God threw down to us through Jesus. He calls us to live to an even higher standard than just the law. And there may be things that God asks you to not do that others are completely fine with. And it's not wrong for them, but it's wrong for you. And you go, well, that's not fair. Hey, your calling is what God is, is, is special to you. And this is, I mean, this is the case, right, for a lot of people. Like, is, let's be honest, is al- drinking alcohol bad in itself? No. But if alcohol is going to control you, it may be a sin for you to drink alcohol. Because the word sin, chata, means to miss the mark. If what it's doing is keeping you from missing the mark of what you're called to do in your life, alcohol may be a sin for you. And here's the really crazy part. God may ask you to step away from something for a while, and then he'll let you go back to it later when it won't control you. But only he knows what's going to be best for you at the time. And you may look around and go, and this, if some of you are like, I don't even know if I agree with Joel on this. It's fine. Look it up in the Bible. Like Paul says, if, any, if on anything we don't agree, just God will show you the truth shortly. But anyway, <laughs> this is what's this is the case. And I see this a lot of times. The people that rise to higher levels in their spiritual walk to God are the ones who are super sensitive to the Holy Spirit speaking to them and saying, right now, I don't want you to do that. I may release you to do that later. Because here's the crazy thing. In Christ, it says it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't be in bondage again to a yoke of slavery. This is, what, this is what's really scary about grace. Paul says, all things are permissible for me, but not everything is profitable. And there's all sorts of things in your life that God may say, hey, right now, I don't want you to do that. Video games, nothing wrong with those, but they're taking you away from your child and focusing on your child. So right now, I need you to hang up the video games. And you look at other people like, well, how come they can get away with it? Hey, that's between you and God. There's a verse that says, each man rises or falls before his own master so you don't judge another man's servant. Mm. So the question is, what is the Holy Spirit convicting you specifically of? And and, and, and this is the crazy thing. You can be doing everything that the law requires and still not being doing what God requires because Jesus upped the ante and he says, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to guide you. You go, well, that sounds super legalistic. It's not legalistic. It's setting you free to be all he knows you can be. And if there's something that he sees is going to be a hindrance for you, alcohol, you know, there's some things that are just bad for you, period. But alcohol is one of those weird gray things, gray areas. And he goes, and there may be a season where he says, nope, you can't do that right now, especially if you're coming out of alcoholism. Alcohol is bad for you. Do not touch alcohol. Don't think you can dabble in it and get away with it. You got to get really hardcore and serious about it, and the Holy Spirit will convict you and guide you. And that's the gift. And, and listen, if we didn't have the Holy Spirit, to, we'd be in big trouble. And that's where we're saying, don't speak against the Holy Spirit. That's the unforgivable sin. And, and let me just answer the question for you. Some of you are going, well, what, have I committed the unforgivable sin? If you're asking if you've committed the unforgivable sin, you probably haven't because you're even concerned about it. It would be somebody that has just thrown every desire to please God out the, out the window. And here's the really crazy thing. He doesn't even say the Pharisees have done it. He just says they're in danger of doing it. So I don't know, theologically or whatever. My point is this. The Holy Spirit is super important in helping you figure out what are the boundaries that you need to live within to protect you from harm and from self-destruction. And you've got to hear him. And there may be something right now that you're going, how come everybody else can do this? But I feel guilty when I do it. Listen to the Holy Spirit's promptings and obey him. Because it may be wrong for you and fine for other people. And there's probably stuff you do that's fine for you, but wrong for other people. But you've got to hear him and you've got to listen to that voice. And when he brings conviction, you do whatever it takes to get in line with what he says. So he goes on. This is what he says. I still have Jesus continuing right before he leaves. He says, I still have a lot of things to say to you, but you can't handle them right now. You can't handle the truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you things that are to come. So here's the second gift of the Holy Spirit and why it's so important that we recognize the power of the Holy Spirit and and, and, and just we don't negate what he offers. The Holy Spirit is our guide to understanding and embracing truth. We live in a world, I mean, we did a whole series on this a few weeks ago, 
We live in a world full of lies, half-truths, deception. Some of the worst some of the worst deception is stuff that's partially true, and we buy into it. And it's hard to navigate. Who's telling the truth? Because everybody's got an agenda. Not only that, we all have partial truth. There's this, there's this verse where Paul says this. He says, we all see through a glass darkly. It's like we have glasses on that we can only kind of see. We don't have a lot of peripheral vision, and it's kind of dark and cloudy. And he says, but when we see him, we'll be like him, and we'll know as we are known. Hmm. But right now... We only ever know partial truth, and that should keep us really humble because at any given point, there's probably something you don't know because truth is really, really, really big. And here's the really crazy part about truth. It unfolds in layers, and there are some things that you go, man, this is, you know, the more I read the Bible, I'm like, wow, I thought I knew how true the Bible, but the Bible is truer than true. It's just reality. Like cold, hard reality. I mean, it's beyond true. It's like ultimate, total, complete truth. And you're forever throughout your life. If you ever think you've got the corner on truth, you need to be very, 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 very careful. Because you probably, I know for sure you don't, in fact. And it can lead to pride. And that's one of the things we see in our current world today is a lot of people, that are, they just know they've got the truth because they have science. But I had a scientist tell me from Stanford one time, tell me, he's like, the thing about it is science should be the most humbling thing in the world because you're constantly going, what do I don't, what do I not know? And I'm trying to prove myself that I don't know more and more by understanding the mysteries of the universe. And the Holy Spirit is the only way you're going to learn truth in this world. It's the only way you're going to feel truth. And it may, you may have, you may have the crowd telling you one thing, but deep inside your heart, the Holy Spirit is saying, that's not right. I need you to do this. And you've got to trust what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And again, he may tell you to do something completely different than he tells another person. We all have our own unique journey to walk. But apart from him, you're doomed. You need his guidance in this world full of lies. And you need to be going, Holy Spirit, I need you to guide me in this. I know what the word says on this. And he'll never contradict the word of God. Trust me on that. That's why it's so important to understand the Word of God. He will never contradict the Word of God. But there are some things in the Word of God that are more principles than rules. And principles are flexible. And he say, right now, that's what Jesus operated by. That's why nobody could ever figure out Jesus. Like, Jesus, we caught this lady in adultery. And he's like, ah, go your way. He's like, what? Like, she got caught in flagrante derelicto. Like, she was caught in the middle of this. And he's like, just let her go. Then other times, somebody comes up and sincerely is like, oh, uh, Jesus, I want to follow you. And he's like, no, nah, you don't. <laughs> like, what? The Holy Spirit was guiding him in truth. What was truth? And the Holy Spirit, when you've got the Holy Spirit, there might be some business deals where you look at it on paper and you go, man, this looks really good. And the Holy Spirit's telling you, nah, 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 don't do it. And you go against what he's saying at your peril because he is the gift of guiding you in all truth. Then finally, Jesus says this, last words before he leaves the earth. Weren't about him. The last words, again, were about the Holy Spirit. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. It's the last thing he said. He said, guys, I'm about to pour out power on you through the Holy Spirit God in the form of the Spirit that's going to come and guide you. But not only that, he's going to give you the power to live the life that you're called to live. And if you look, it's so fascinating. If you look, as soon as the Holy Spirit came, all these guys, these chickens that were hanging out, trying to hide because they were worried that they might get arrested like Jesus had been arrested, all of a sudden, courage and power came over them. And they started declaring the word of God to people in Jerusalem without any fear. The power you need to live this life is not going to come from anywhere apart from the Holy Spirit living in you. You go, what is, what is that even, like, if, if you haven't experienced this, you don't know what I'm talking about. But the Holy Spirit, he is the one who's going to get, again, we've talked about this before, the things Jesus asked of us are really hard to do apart from the Holy Spirit giving you the power to do them. Because I know my willpower and you know your willpower, they're really bad. I don't have a lot of willpower. And some people are like, you have tons of willpower. I'm like, no, trust me. I don't have a lot of willpower. The things that God's going to ask you to do are going to require a power that's beyond anything you can do on your own. 
People say, God will never give you anything more than you can handle. That's BS. He'll give you stuff more than you can handle all the time because he wants you to depend on the Holy Spirit at work within you. And you go, man, God must trust me a lot because he's given a lot more than I can handle. He's not trusting you. He's trusting the Holy Spirit's ability to work in you and do things that you could never do on your own. But that power you need to live is not going to come from optimism. I don't care how optimistic you are. It's not going to come from optimism. It's not going to come from your morning declarations, which I'm all for affirmations. I'm beautiful. I'm great. I'm talented. It's not going to come from that. I'm all for those. Whatever. Tell yourself whatever you want, but make sure it's grounded in truth, right? But the power that you need to live in this world is only going to come from the Holy Spirit. And I think that's why Jesus was so savage about people attacking the Holy Spirit at work and calling it Satan. And I don't know. I mean, who, who would do that? I don't know. But we live in a world where people call dark things good all the time. Right. And they call good things dark. It's a whole, the whole world's screwed up. We're like we're in the twilight zone. A friend of mine's like, nah, actually, I think we've been living in the twilight zone. I think this is reality. I'm like, yeah, this is probably reality. Like, the more horrible side of humanity we're just seeing out in, 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 in the open. But let me tell you this, right in the middle of that, the most important thing you can do is say, I know that the power I need to live this life, the wisdom I need to raise my kids right now, even though I cannot figure out what's going on in that teenager's crazy mind, I know that the the power I need to get up every morning and face the day with optimism, even though this in hope and faith, even though it looks like things are going really bad, I know that the the power I need to, to... restore this marriage relationship, it's only going to come from God himself, poured out through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's what Jesus says. He's like, guys, it's really good that I'm leaving because the man is on his way. The Holy Spirit, he is going to guide you. He is going to be the one that's going to give you the power to live this thing out. It says, it actually says the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. And every one of you, if you've accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit is available to you. You've just got to listen. And you've got to tune out what the world's saying. You've got to tune out what your own mind is saying sometimes. Because how many know some of our worst critics are right here at the battlefield in our mind? You've got to say, I, you know what? This is what I'm saying about myself, but I don't, that's not what the Holy Spirit is saying. And you've got to get really quiet. And you've got to say, Holy Spirit, what is it that you're saying to me right now? How do I need to deal with this situation with my kids? What do I need to do in this financial situation? This business proposition they've given me on paper looks really good, but just because it looks good on paper, I'm not going to ignore asking you what I'm supposed to do. And there may be other business propositions that look horrible on paper, and the Holy Spirit says, move on that one. I'm going to breathe in direct your direction and bless it in a way you never could have imagined. This is where it's so tricky. Guys, this is so important. There is no formula for life. We want a formula. There's only revelation from the Holy Spirit. There's principles in the Bible that the world has got, Lord has given us. He said, stay away from these things. They're going to destroy you. But in so many areas of life where it's gray, there's no formula. There's only guidance from the Holy Spirit. And in each situation, our job is to drop to our knees and say, God, you know, I'm going to seek first what you want. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding, but in all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge you and you'll direct my path. And you say, God, in every decision, is this what you're asking me to do? And I, you can be confident of this. If anyone lacks wisdom, it says God will give it to you. Even if you haven't been very wise in the past, it says. In James, it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, he will give it to you. And he doesn't have any regard for your bad past decisions. Seek his wisdom and he will guide you. And this is how we rise above in this crazy world we're in. God's going to be giving you wisdom. And, you're going to, and people are going to go, well, how did you see that coming? You didn't see it coming, but the Holy Spirit guided you to make that decision right in the middle of it. And you're making wise choices right in the middle of all the chaos around you. And that's how you let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They see you walking by the Spirit in this crazy world. You guys receive that? Yes. All right, let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that you didn't leave us alone. You left the Holy Spirit who was 
active and living inside of us to guide us in all truth. So I pray for those this week that have hard decisions to make with their kids, hard decisions to make with their finances. Lord, I pray for those that they're about to get together with their worst enemies, the people in their own family. And I thank you, Lord, that this week you're going to give them wisdom as they seek your Holy Spirit. They want to speak something, but Lord, you're going to show them what they need to say or when they need to keep their mouth closed. And we just pray this week, your peace will guide our decisions in every way because your Holy Spirit brings peace. We thank you for that peace. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get that relationship right. Just, we're going to say a prayer, and if you say this prayer, God is going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, set you up with an eternal address with him in eternity. It starts when we say this prayer. Say this together with me. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you. Uh, in the back. You guys stand, and uh, man, I pray y'all have a great Thanksgiving week. Be blessed. Eat eat within reason, (laughs) and we'll see y'all Sunday. Be blessed. Have a good week. (laughs) If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m., or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.